This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. Revelation, chapter number 20. I'll say just a few words of introduction while you're turning there. You know, I have noticed that the crazier things get in the world around us and the closer it seems that we are getting to the end times, the crazier the views are that seem to be out there about the end times and what's coming up next and where we are and and all of that. And so I want to bring a message to you this morning that will try to get us grounded back in the Word of God, what the Bible actually says about the end times, where we are, where we're headed, and some of those things to come in the future to try to make sure that everything you and I believe and understand about the end times is grounded in this book, not in whatever those other theories or views are that are so, uh, so many, it seems like today. In fact, they, uh, well, some of them are just kind of far out. Uh, you'll hear me mention a few of those this morning, but my main purpose is to keep us grounded in the Word of God. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word. As I read our text this morning, found in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, the first 10 verses. And if you're not able to remain standing the entire time, you, of course, feel free to be seated. Here's what the Apostle John records under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ." and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is, of course, talking about the very end of times, humanly speaking. It's dealing with the millennial reign of Christ, and then at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, the loosing of Satan for a little season of time, just a short amount of time, to gather all of his armies together, the rebellious of mankind, for one last hurrah in an attempt to dethrone the Lord Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Creator and King. There are, as I said, so many different views that are being espoused 
in the world today, even among Christians today, about what the millennium is, what that little season of time is at the end, and what's going to happen, how it will all come to pass at the end. So many different views, some of which, as I said, are very far afield from the Word of God. But my desire this morning is to make sure you and I understand prophetically what this book teaches, sequence by sequence, so that you and I are not caught unawares of where we are in the timeline, what's coming up next, or what is going to take place in the future. You and I need to be able to refute those who have a very far afield views, we ought to be able to refute them with Scripture. And that's my desire this morning. I want to bring a message to you this morning entitled, The Millennium, Mud Floods, and a Little Season. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would take the reading of your word. Lord, allow it to accomplish that which you desire for it to accomplish. I pray, Father, that each of us would have in our minds and in our hearts right doctrine right teaching from your word. Lord, not just to know academically what's coming up next, but Lord, how it ought to affect us today. Father, I pray that we would be a congregation that are on fire for you, that are zealous for you and for your word. I pray that you would use us to win many to righteousness. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I was having a conversation with TR while we were on vacation up in Gatlinburg this past week. I think it was actually the day before we went whitewater rafting. We were sitting in one of the restaurants and we were talking and TR was telling me that they recently had him do something he had not yet done at the fire department. They had him create and type up uh, for some of the buildings they had gone and toured in the city of Griffin what was called a PIP a pre-incident plan. T.R., did I get that right? All right. I was listening. See, he thinks his daddy doesn't listen to him when he talks, but at least sometimes I'm listening. But he was explaining to me that with a pre-incident plan, what they do is the firefighters go through and they tour all the different buildings in the city of Griffin, and they have a a blueprint or a, a floor plan of the building. And on that blueprint they will designate as they're going through making that tour where certain things are that are of interest to a firefighter were there to be an emergency. They note where the the exits are. you got to know how to get in and how to get out, especially if you're inside trying to fight a fire. He said they also note some of the things that could be the cause of a fire or cause something to become a greater fire on the inside. And he said they make notes of those things on the PIP, and then when they get called out to an emergency, the dispatcher is supposed to pull that up in the records and read over the phone to whoever the commanding officer is while they're en route or once they get there, anything that's of importance that they need to know before they might have to go into the building. Well, I was thinking about that in relation to the message that I was already preparing for today, and TR, it fit right in with what... God's laid on my heart for this morning because we know that there are still things to come in the end times that this book has talked about, things that are still yet to come. And it is important for us, I believe, as Bible-believing Christians today to know where we are in the pre-incident plan of things to come so that, first of all, we're not caught unawares of things that might be coming up in the near future and also because we have an obligation to those all around us to share the truth with them. And when necessary, to impress upon them, to inculcate upon them the seriousness of making a decision now, today, not in the future. A couple of Wednesday nights ago, uh, we answered a question during the Q&A together of, What about those people who have heard a clear presentation of the gospel before the rapture takes place and they rejected it? Will they be able to be saved during the tribulation? Now, I'll just tell you, I think as your pastor, the short answer to that is no. If they've heard a clear presentation of the gospel before the rapture takes place, I think 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is pretty clear that their opportunity is past and they will be one of the ones to believe the lie that's coming. 
So it is incumbent upon us that when we meet someone who's not yet saved, and we know what is coming up because we know where we are in the middle of the floor plan, we ought to be, if necessary, begging, pleading, imploring those around us to receive Christ today, not put it off. So what I want to do as I'm starting this morning, though, is I want to use the front of the sanctuary up here. And I'm going to start over here because as the way you're looking at it, this would be the beginning of events. And we're going to march that direction towards the end of history. We are currently over here in what is frequently known as the church age, the age of grace. This began with either the cross or the day of Pentecost, however you want to define the beginning of the church age. And it will go until the Lord appears in the clouds to catch up the church with Him. We call it the rapture. I know the word rapture is not specifically in our English Bible, but that's what the word, uh, the word means, a snatching away, which is in the Bible. And so the concept is there. So that is the next event prophetically on God's timeline. It's going to end the church age because the church will be taken out of here. And when we're taken out of here, so too is the ministry of the Holy Spirit changed in a moment just like that. At this point, the Holy Spirit has been indwelling every believer 24-7 from the day you got saved, the moment you got saved. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that. But when the Holy Spirit, when His ministry is changed at the time of the rapture, He's going to stop what He's been doing for the last 2,000 years of church history, holding back, holding back, the forces of evil, of Satan, of the Antichrist that is yet to come, the Holy Spirit's going to stop holding them back and just let them have their way. Satan is going to have his way on the earth for that next seven years. I'm going to use this period right here in the middle aisle as the tribulation period. And for that seven years, God is going to allow Satan to do pretty much whatever he wants to do and have his rule and reign here on the earth. And the lost crowd who are left behind after the church is raptured out of here, I like the way it's said in in that old series of movies uh, that I saw as a boy growing up, the lost world is going to get what they said they always wanted, a world without God. It's not going to be a time that I would want to live in. The first three and a half years of that, if you read what's in the Bible, it's it's not a good situation at all. But then the latter three and a half years are even worse because that's when God begins to pour out His judgment upon lost mankind as well. What an awful, awful situation. The Bible calls the tribulation period a time of Jacob's trouble. Because God is going to be purifying Israel. Those that are truly the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're going to be put through the fire. Many of them will reject Christ just as they reject Christ today. At the very end of the tribulation period, the remnant that remain, however many or few there are, the Bible says they will all be saved and they will believe on Christ as their Messiah. And when they cry out to Him, that's when He will split the eastern sky, come back. He will destroy all their enemies at the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation period and save that remnant who believed on Him of Israel. At that point, He then sets up a thousand-year reign on earth where He will literally physically, visibly, set foot on the Mount of Olives at the second coming and He will set down on the throne of David in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem will be His capital of the entire world for the next thousand years. The Bible says in the book of Zechariah that during that thousand years He will rule with a rod of iron. There will be no one who will 
outwardly rebel against His rule. It doesn't mean though that in their hearts they're following Him. For there will still be multiplied thousands and perhaps millions who will not believe on Him, not receive Him as their Lord, their Savior, even seeing Him sitting there in person on the throne of David. They will still reject Him in their hearts. You say, preacher, how could somebody reject Him, seeing Him come back, seeing Him destroy His enemies, and seeing Him sit on the throne of David in person? How could anyone still reject Him? Brother Wynn, I think it's the same reason that people reject Him today. It's because they are rebellious in their hearts. They do not want anyone telling them what to do, including the Creator. And so during that thousand years, while He is personally, visibly, physically ruling the earth as the King, there will be those in their hearts that are rebellious against Him. Now at the beginning of that thousand years, the Bible says Satan, we read it in our passage this morning, Satan is bound and put in the bottomless pit for the next thousand years. So it will be almost the opposite on earth of what it was during the tribulation. During the tribulation, Satan had his reign to just run free and do what everyone to do. But during the next thousand years, that old excuse mankind has used for so long, the devil made me do it, it won't be any good for the thousand years because the devil won't be anywhere around. He'll be chained in the bottomless pit for the thousand years. But we read in verses 7 through 10 this morning that at the very end of the millennial reign of Christ, Jesus is going to have Satan released, unbound from the bottomless pit for a little season. And when Satan comes roaring up out of the bottomless pit, he knows his time is drawing nigh. He knows he only has a short season. Hey, listen, if you and I know it, because we read it in the Bible, I assure you, the devil knows it too. You've all seen or read or heard uh, what an animal is like when it's backed into a corner. Several weeks ago, I preached a message on uh, Benaiah going down into a pit and slaying a lion on a snowy day. How he had that lion in a pit, backed up with his back against the wall, and only one of them was coming out of there. Well, you can imagine what Satan is going to be like, knowing he has only a short amount of time. It's about to all be over. This is his last hurrah, his last opportunity to overthrow God and install himself as the ruler of all that there is. Now, you and I know... All of that. We've talked about it so many times here at Pinnacle Baptist Church. There's the brief timeline of those things that are still yet to come. So what I want to do this morning for the last few minutes that I have is is I want to to try to not only demonstrate to you that this is in fact what's going to take place, but I want to take some of those false views of the end times that have become so prevalent. And I know they're prevalent because I've had four of you in the last month that have come to me with questions about some of what I'm going to deal with this morning. There are so many false views of the end times that are so prevalent today, I want to dismantle them, destroy them so you can write them off and be done with them and not worry about them and also so that you can explain to others how they are unbiblical, unscriptural going forward. So that's our goal this morning. I want to begin with a word that maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't. It doesn't really matter if you've heard the word or not. You've heard the concept before. The word is preterism. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M. Preterism. Uh, Preterism is the belief that when we're talking about what you and I call the end time events, prophetic events, preterism says that some 
or all of those things have already occurred. That they started when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed right after the resurrection around A.D. 70. And then shortly after that, all of those things that you and I just mapped out for the end times, all of those things have already happened. Those that believe in full preterism believe they've all already happened. Those who believe in partial preterism believe some of them have happened and there's still a few left to be fulfilled after this. The word preterism comes from the Latin word prater, which means past. In other words, they believe these things are already in the past. They've already happened. That is the things you and I just talked about with the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign of Christ, and those events at the end of the millennial reign. Some people believe those things have already played out in human history. They've come and gone and we're past all of that. I'll be honest with you, looking at the world today, even if I was a new Christian and didn't know what I know about the Bible today, I would find that hard to believe that these end time events have already played out. Because I assure you, things are getting worse. And they're going to continue to get worse. They're not getting better, they're getting worse. This notion of preterism, those who espouse this view would have you to believe that it's what everybody in church history believed up until just a couple hundred years ago. That up until uh, John Nelson Darby did his writings and, and began to teach um, the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, which is what we believe, and dispensational theology about God having different time periods of human history, which we believe, that until John Nelson Darby started writing about that, about uh, the, the mid to late 1800s, nobody, nobody believed what we believe. They all believed in preterism, that it had all already happened. Now the truth is John Nelson Darby didn't come up with what you and I believe 100, 200 years ago. No, that's not the truth. I preached a message about six or seven months ago where I mapped out that Bible-believing churches have been teaching and preaching a pre-trib rapture of the church all the way back to the first century, the days of the apostles themselves. And I went chronologically backwards with all the evidences and the proofs of their own writings to demonstrate that. I'm not going to do that this morning. I encourage you to go back and listen to it if you didn't get to hear that one. But they would have us believe that what you and I believe about a pre-trib rapture of the church and all those other end time events still being future, that we, we just made it up. That folks that believe like us just made it up 100, 200 years ago. That's not the case. Preterism has been around for a long time. But Bible-believing Christians have not believed in preterism a long, long time. In fact, Bible-believing Christians who take this book literally have never believed in preterism all the way back to the early centuries of the church. So where did this idea come from? Where did the idea come from that we had already gone through those end-time events? Well, it started in the same place that all those false versions of the Bible originated, Alexandria, Egypt. It was the original source of Gnosticism in the early church, which is uh, really just Freemasonry and Mystery Babylon trying to make its way into the church. There's the nutshell version of it. And there are two writers in particular in what they call the early church fathers who believed in preterism. Now, you and I aren't going to call them church fathers because they weren't even saved. They weren't part of the church. The Catholic church can call them church fathers because they were fathers of their church, but not of any Bible-believing church. The first one is a man we talked about when we were 
talking about the history of the church in a series we recently did on Sunday evenings. His name was Origen. He lived uh, around 180 to 200 A.D. And Origen said he believed that those end time events had all already occurred, starting with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Between then and his lifetime, those events had already occurred that you and I consider the end times. But this is a man who allegorized everything in the Scripture. He said none of it was literal. It was all just an allegory, a pretty little story intended to teach us some truths, but the details aren't literal. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to listen to any preacher who gets behind any pulpit and says that this book isn't literal. But not only did he allegorize things, he's also responsible for introducing such wonderful doctrines to what later became the Catholic Church as Mariolatry, that is, worshiping Mary, praying to Mary. He's also the one who introduced praying to saints. So if you, before you got saved, if you had your favorite patron saint that you had on the, uh, the little Kubi doll, uh, Kubi doll up on the, the mantle, Hey, you can thank Origen for coming up with that idea. He came up with the idea that the, the blood of martyred saints can also wash away sins just like the blood of Jesus can wash away sins. Now, I don't have to go any further than I've already gone for you to know that Origen was not a saved man at all. He wasn't a Christian, period. But he is really the one who authored the idea, as far as we can tell from written records, the first one to begin espousing the views of preterism. That those end time events have already happened. And as I said, he said they didn't happen literally. He kind of believed what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe about the second coming of Christ, that the second coming wasn't a literal, physical coming of Christ. It was a spiritual coming. And he allegorized everything. The other man from early church history, quote-unquote church history, who espoused preterism was a fellow named Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius was the one that when Emperor Constantine got together with the apostate churches and said, hey, I want to start a universal religion for the Roman Empire. I need, uh, I need a, a collection of Bibles for us to use in the churches for this new religion. And he created the Roman Universal Church. You know it as the Roman Catholic Church. That's what the word Catholic means, is universal. And in order to create it, as we've talked about, they took pieces of all the pagan religions of the Roman Empire, put them all together in one big mishmash, and called it Christian. They put Christian names to pagan doctrines and practices. That's why Roman Catholicism doesn't look anything like Christianity because it's actually paganism with Christian names applied to different parts of it. But Eusebius was the one who put together 50 Bibles to be used by the beginning of the Catholic Church for Emperor Constantine and his pagan universal church. So was Origen a Christian? No. Was Eusebius a Christian? No. But I'll guarantee you, you will never hear those who espouse preterism admit that their doctrines came from those two individuals who weren't even born again Christians. But you and I ought to know where it came from. The source says a lot about the view itself. And then later on, near the 16th century, there was a Jesuit who picked up the ideas of Origen and Eusebius and during the Protestant Reformation, he promoted the idea of preterism. His name, Louis de Alcazar, a, Jewish, uh, a Jesuit priest, in 1614 wrote a book entitled Investigation of the Hidden Sense of the Apocalypse. In other words, he wrote a book saying that everything in the book of Revelation was just an allegory. It wasn't literal. 
And he said that all of those events that you and I view as the end time events had already happened in the past. He was espousing preterism, repeating, echoing the words of origin. And I bet you won't hear those today who espouse preterism acknowledge that a Jesuit was the one that was promoting that belief during the Protestant Reformation. In fact, I'm sure that some who may listen to this online later will find it appalling to hear those words being said. But someone ought to say it because it was unsaved people and unsaved Jesuits that came up with this false doctrine that end time events have already happened. It is not so. Those events are still yet to play out. We know that they will, but they've not yet played out. Before I move on, I'll, I'll say one other thing to, to counter those quote-unquote early church fathers, Origen and Eusebius. Not all Bible-believing Christians believed that back then, in spite of what they would have you to believe. As far back as A.D. 150, before Origen ever came on the scene, Tertullian was... He numbered himself among the Montanists, Anabaptists, and the Montanist Anabaptists were known more than anything else for their extreme views on the imminency of the second coming of Christ. It's called Chiliism. But those Montanist Anabaptists in the first and second century believed that the, the second coming was, was coming very soon. They didn't believe it had already happened. They be believed it was still coming. So this belief that these end time events had already happened, that's not something that Bible believing Christians have ever believed all the way back to the first century. And then you have some groups that today believe something about the millennium that's very similar to preterism, though they don't claim it to be preterism, and that's the Seventh-day Adventists. Anybody here ever met a Seventh-day Adventist or talked with them about what they believe? I just want to say this. I'm not preaching a message on Seventh-day Adventism this morning, but Seventh-day Adventism is not Christian. It is a false, false doctrine, false teaching, just like Roman Catholicism and so many others out there. But Seventh-day Adventists believe in what they call historicism. And they say historicism is similar to preterism, but a little different. They say that some of the events that you and I view as the end times, some of them have already happened, and we're just kind of working our way through church history with some of those events happening along the way as we go, but some of them still haven't happened yet. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's not a whole lot of difference between historicism and a partial preterist. They still believe some of the events of the end times have already happened. Some of them haven't yet happened. Neither of those positions is biblical. But Seventh-day Adventists are the ones most of the time, if you hear somebody on the TV, on the radio, or on YouTube that are talking about this thing with events that have already happened in the past, even though you and I know they're still future, most of the time they are coming from a Seventh-day Adventist theological perspective. Not always, but probably 90% of the time. So do your homework. If somebody starts talking like that, a bell ought to ring up here, a light ought to go off, saying, oh, I wonder if they have some Seventh-day Adventist theology that's propelling them in this false view of the end times. Now, what I want to do for the rest of my time this morning is I want to look at some of the specific passages of Scripture that they use to try to say that, in fact, those events were immediate and happened right after the resurrection of Christ or right after the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. I want to look at the verses they use because I want you to see them because if they throw them out there and you've never seen them before, you're not sure what to do with them, uh, you might be like I was when I 
first heard them the first time when I was a, a Sunday school bus captain 30 years ago, and somebody threw some of this at me when I was knocking on doors one day, inviting people to church. I'd never heard it before, didn't know how to respond. So I want you, if you would, turn to these passages with me. They're all in the book of Matthew. The first one is Matthew chapter number 24. In Matthew chapter number 24, this is probably the verse that they, the passage that they use most frequently. As soon as the pastor gets there, I'll read it. In Matthew chapter 24, look with me if you would at verse 34. Verse 34, Jesus speaking says, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, what things? Well, He just described... All of the events that occur before the tribulation, he described events that occurred during the tribulation, and then he described some events of the millennial reign of Christ and the events after the tribulation. And he said in verse 34, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And that's when the preterist or the historicist says, See... Jesus said, while He's talking to those people, that this generation will see all those things. I'm sorry, that's not what the passage is teaching. That's not what Jesus said. And the only thing you have to do to see what He actually said is read it in its context and find out who this generation is to whom Jesus is referring. Yes, Jesus was standing there talking to some individuals in his lifetime, but that this generation was not applied to the people standing there looking him in the eye. He defined who this generation is earlier in the passage. Look back with me, if you would, to verse number 3 of the same chapter. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse number 3, It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then in verse 4, Jesus answered them. So they're asking him, Lord, when are all these end time things going to be? And Jesus starts describing things that are going to happen before the tribulation, things that are going to be during the tribulation, and things that are going to be after the tribulation. And then He says in verse 34, this generation will not pass away till all these things come to pass. He was not talking about the generation of Peter, James, and John. He was talking about the generation that's going to be around when those things start happening. And the further proof of that is in verse 36 when he describes the event that starts all of those end time events. Look with me if you would to verse 36. It says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That, of course, is the rapture of the church. The event that kicks off all of those end time events is the rapture of the church when He appears in the clouds, and no one knows when He's going to appear in the clouds. You and I don't know. Uh, The Seventh-day Adventists don't know. The angels in heaven don't know. The Bible says not even the Son of God knows. He has chosen voluntarily to not know that. That's the event that starts those end-time events. That is the generation that will see all these other things play out. That's the this generation that will see all those things. Not the generation of Peter, James, and John, but the generation that sees the rapture of the church. I, I wanna, I, I've said this before and I preached a message on it again about a year ago when we had a series of sermons on end time events I want to share one thing with you that will help more than anything else 
when you're reading Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 and other passages to help you understand how all these end time events fit together, and that is this. Here it is in a nutshell. That phrase, the day of the Lord, yes, sometimes it is used for the very day of the second coming where Zechariah says he will literally, physically, visibly set foot on the Mount of Olives. But that phrase, the day of the Lord, is also used for all of this end times period. We know it encompasses those other events too because it names those other events that are included in the day of the Lord, not just the day of the second coming. Well, preacher... Where where are those other passages? Well, it took me almost an hour that Sunday to preach that message and demonstrate that. I'm not going to do that this morning. You can go back and listen to it. But understanding that the day of the Lord is not just a single day, but a period of time is the key to understanding Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. By the way, tonight is our last night in the book of Joel in our Sunday evening Bible study. And in Joel chapter 3 tonight, we'll be talking about the day of the Lord that is yet to come. So if you're able to, come be here. You'll get to hear part of that tonight. But the, this generation that they use as their evidence to say, say, see, it already happened in the days of the apostles. No, that's not the this generation Jesus was talking about. And anyone who reads their Bible carefully, in context, the way we always ought to do it, can see that plainly for themselves. Here's another passage they like to use. Look, look just a couple of chapters over to Matthew 26, all the way down to verse 64. It's a long chapter. In Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now to who was Jesus speaking when He said this? Well, it tells us in verse 62, He was talking to the high priest, the Jewish high priest of His day. Jesus said, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The preterist, the historicist, Seventh-day Adventist would say, See, Jesus told the high priest that ye are going to see these things. They've already happened, preacher. It's already in the past, they would say. But you and I know they haven't yet happened. They're still in the future. How do we know that? I'm going to show you one of the reasons your pastor only preaches out of a King James Bible and why I hope you use a King James Bible. Having said that, let me give another disclaimer here. I love you. I have no idea what, in, what kind of Bible anybody here brought this morning but me and that firefighter sitting in the sound booth back there. I have no idea what Bible anybody here has. So... I promise, I'm only saying this in love. The reason your pastor, one of the reasons your pastor uses a King James Bible is because it was translated correctly from the right manuscripts to begin with. If you read the ESV, the RSV, the NASV, the New King James Version, outs preacher. If you read any of those versions, you're going to read something different than what I read this morning in that verse. Verse 64 in all of those other versions excuse me, says, You shall see these things come to pass. All right? So here's the big excuse that all those Christian bookstores tell you you ought to be reading something different than a King James Bible. The language is too hard to understand in that old archaic Elizabethan English. You ought to get you something newer where the language is updated. 
I know the argument. I've argued with the argument for 30 plus years. So let me give you a perfect example from this passage. All of those versions I just listed and, and some others, they translate that word when Jesus is speaking to the high priest, you. Now, if you remember anything about high school grammar, hopefully you do, you is a pronoun. And in the English language, unfortunately, it's not always clear whether it's one you or more than one you. That's why here in the South, we Southerners say you all, if we mean more than one of you. Right? Y'all. And that's because that's what the Apostle Paul did frequently. Uh, there are many times in the New Testament where Paul says, you all. It's because he's making it obvious. He's making it clear. The King James Bible is a more accurate translation than any other English Bible you could pick up that's printed today. Preacher, I don't like the these and thous and the yees. All right, let me make this so simple for you. When you see thee or thou, that's one person. If you see ye, that's more than one. That's the plural version in Elizabethan English. I see some of the, the light bulbs going off. The King James Bible does a better job of helping you understand whoever the person is being spoken to in every passage than all those modern versions do. Because when they say you, you don't know if they mean you singular or you plural. And maybe sometimes it's not a big deal. But some people have built a whole doctrine out of misinterpreting the verse I just read in verse 64 because they think that, that ye means Jesus was talking to and about the high priest. Him, personally, you, you high priest. That's not what it says. In the King James Bible, it plainly says, ye. He was not talking to the high priest. He was talking to all of those who don't believe. He wasn't talking to one man. He was talking to all of those that are in his camp. Not only those that were standing there with the high priest that day, but those that hadn't been born yet, but were going to be in the same camp as the high priest later on. Do, do you see how something as simple as a two-letter pronoun can make all the difference in the world on what a verse is actually saying or not saying? And some people have used this passage to build their preterist view of the end times already having happened on not knowing the Bible or using a wrong Bible and it mes misled them. I, I've got one more passage. Don't, don't give up on me and leave yet. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 16. I told you I'd keep you in the book of Matthew. Made it easy for you this morning. I actually made it easy for the preacher too. Matthew chapter 16. Look with me at verse 28. Jesus is speaking again. He says, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. There be some standing here. Now, again, the preterists would say, Aha, you got off on the first two, preacher, but I'm going to get you on this one. Jesus said, there are some of you standing here, talking to His disciples, there are some of you standing here that are not going to taste of death till you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Ah, see? How are you going to get out of this one, preacher? Well, again, I'm going to use grammar. And I'm going to use what the text actually says. The word some is what's called an indefinite pronoun. There's another pronoun. See, you should have learned those pronouns when you were in grammar class. An indefinite pronoun means I did not single out a specific one. 
It could be that one. It could be this one. It could be a certain one over there. But I didn't tell you which one. I just said one. That word some, the, the Greek word is translated over 150 times in the Bible as, let me make sure I've got it right. Somebody will call me out if I don't get it right. Let me get it right for you. It's translated more than 150 times as one, one man, or a certain man. 150 times. Here it's translated some. It's the same word. So let me ask you, when Jesus had His disciples there with Him, and He says, one of you, a certain one of you, will not taste, into, taste of death until He sees the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Was that a true statement? Of course that was a true statement. There was one of those standing with Jesus that day that would not taste of death till he saw that. It was John the Revelator, the Apostle John, who recorded the entire book of the Revelation. John was standing there in the throne room of God in Revelation chapter 4 and saw all of the end time events unfold. John saw all of those things before he ever tasted of death. John said he was caught up to, caught up to heaven. He was worshiping the Lord, worshiping in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he was caught up to heaven. So that doesn't mean that the events were going to happen in Peter, James, and John's day that we that we know are end time events. No, Jesus was saying, one of you, before you die, you're going to see those things happen. Now the logical thing you and I would think is, boy, that fellow's going to live a long time if he's going to see all those things. But Jesus knew all of what was going to happen. He didn't mean John was going to live to be 2,000 plus years old. What he was saying is, I'm going to make sure one of you sees this because I'm going to have you record every bit of it before you die. None of those verses that are used by the preterists, the historicists, the Seventh-day Adventists, and all of that crowd, none of those verses prove what they say that they prove. That the generation of Jesus' day was going to see all the end time events occur historically before they died. None of those verses say that or prove that. Do you see how taking a single verse here or there and even a single pronoun here and there can pervert and twist the meaning of the Savior's words to the point that somebody can build a whole doctrine around a false teaching. There have been whole cults built by doing the exact same thing. I know my time is up. Let me finish because I'm not coming back to this subject anytime soon. Please give me just another few minutes here. There is a big movement on the internet right now. People who used to believe what you and I believe, but they've listened to this gobbledygook that I just, I just shared with you that is espoused by these other groups, and they talk about Satan's little season. That is, they're talking about this time at the very end of the millennial reign of Christ where Jesus is going to allow Satan to be released from the bottomless pit for a short time to rebel one last time before he's cast into the lake of fire. And they say that's where we are now. I'm sorry, friends, we're not there. You just skipped over a whole bunch of other things that haven't happened yet. The rapture of the church hasn't happened yet. The tribulation hasn't happened yet. The coming of the Antichrist hasn't happened yet. The second coming of Christ hasn't happened yet. The battle of Armageddon hasn't happened yet. The millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years hasn't happened yet. But they take this mishmash of, of things that they say are historical events and say, see, these things were really... the." the events talked about in the end times, they were being played out over the last thousand 
1,500 years, and we didn't realize we were in the end times for the last 1,000 years. No, friends, I'm sorry. That's not the case. I, I know that some of you are sitting here thinking, Preacher, this is so absurd. Why are you taking time on a Sunday morning to even mention it? But it's because I have had three different people, not members of Pinnacle Baptist Church, but people that love me, and I love them back, that have sent me messages or phone calls saying, Preacher, I've listened to these videos. It looks like they might be right. We might be in that little time at the end of the millennial reign. Some way or another, they've been hoodwinked into thinking the millennium's already come and gone. The tribulation's already come and gone. The rapture, I guess, just hadn't happened because we're still here. Or maybe it happened and some went up and the rest of us are still here afterwards. Those who believe in this Satan's little season that it's currently going on and we currently are living in it, they've taken history and dates and had to change the calendar by four or five hundred years just to make their dates work. There's absolutely no evidence of this whatsoever. I know some people say, well, preacher, you don't have any problem believing in biblical cosmology, which nobody else is preaching, but you have a problem believing in, you you, you have a problem believing that maybe we're in Satan's little season. Yeah, I have a problem with that because there's no historical or biblical evidence of that. When it comes to biblical cosmology, it's everywhere. Kevin sent me a picture the other night just out of the blue and said, how could anybody not see this uh, once you point it out to them? I mean, there's so much evidence in this book and all around us with our physical senses to believe in biblical cosmology once somebody opens your eyes to it. But there's no evidence for that. None. None. You have to twist and contort and and put things together that don't fit to believe it. You have to allegorize those literal events to believe that. They would say they're not allegorizing them. They just already happened and you didn't know about it. They say that the Roman Empire fell about the same time or maybe a few years after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. Now, how many history folks do I have here? I know Clay and Kevin and some, Pam is. All right. Hopefully you remember this from 10th grade world history. Brother Randy, it was my favorite history class in school. 10th grade, world history. The date of the fall of the Roman Empire was not A.D. 70 when the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. The fall of the Roman Empire was A.D. 476 when the city of Rome was sacked. By the way, if you don't know that date, you ought to memorize it, not because it has anything to do with the Bible, but you ought to know important dates in history. That's one of them. But they believe that the fall of the Roman Empire and the destruction of the Jewish temple happened within close proximity to each other on the timeline. That means they just erased nearly 500 years of history to make their Satan's little season theory work. I'm sorry, there's no evidence to suggest that, either historically or biblically. They marvel at how beautiful the Catholic basilicas and the Eastern uh, Catholic cathedrals and the Eastern Orthodox basilicas are that were built during the Middle Ages from 500 to 1500, and they say, see, nobody could build such beautiful architecture unless it was inspired by God. Those things must have been built during the millennial reign of Christ, and and they might have even had angels helping them build those buildings. I'm going to tell you, I've seen, I, I I was an architecture major when I started at Georgia Tech all those years ago, Brother John, long time ago. Another lifetime ago, Miss Mary, I think. And I've seen all those wonders of architecture. I've studied them. 
some of them architecturally, aesthetically are beautiful. But they weren't built during the millennial reign of Christ. They weren't even built by saved people. They were built by Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, people that weren't even saved. They were built by stonemasons, brick masons and others who were good at their craft, but they weren't built during the millennial reign of Christ just because they're beautiful buildings. And they say, well, we don't build beautiful buildings like that anymore. Look at how ornate they are. There's a reason we don't build buildings like that anymore. Or those that have the money don't build buildings like that anymore. It's not because we don't have the ability to build those kind of buildings anymore. It's because in any, any civilization, the architecture mirrors the culture. And today, in our culture and in cultures all over the world in this postmodern scientific age, we don't value beauty anymore. We value pragmatism. Get the most out of it for the least amount of cost. Isn't that right? That's why you don't have ornate, beautiful buildings being built hardly ever anymore. It's not because we can't build them. It's because beauty is not valued anymore like it was then. I mean, if, if I have to convince you of that, I don't suggest you do it, but the next time you see a commercial for Facebook or Google or any of those other social media, the commercials they show today are intentionally trying to put in front of you the exact opposite of beauty. All right, I'm going to show my age a little bit, but growing up, I thought Vivian Lee was the most beautiful lady that ever lived because uh, my mama watched her in Gone with the Wind every year when it came on one time a year. And I just thought Scarlett O'Hara must have been the all to end all as far as beautiful ladies go. You know, up until very recently, most of the time when you watch television or commercials or the big screen, they intentionally tried to put beautiful people in front of you. That was their goal to get people to come watch it. Now they do the opposite. I mean, if you watch the commercials for Facebook, Google, those other social media, I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying it, but they, they want to throw the exact opposite of beautiful out there. Transvestites, homosexuals, ball headed women, tattoos and piercings from head to toe. Okay, I'll stop. But, but that's what they want to throw out there. That's the world's view of beautiful now. It's rebellion against what's good and natural and godly. That's what it is. It's rebellion. They're rebelling against God, really. But that's why we don't have that kind of architecture anymore. And those that put forth these ideas that the end times have already happened and we're in Satan's little season, they would not fare very well in a debate with anyone who knows history. I assure you. They must make things up out of thin air or redefine terms to whatever they want them to be or pretend that dates have been changed and 500 years was added to the calendar with no proof whatsoever. They also believe that the reason some of those buildings, it seems like some of the most beautiful parts of them are one or two stories underneath ground level. And they say that sometime or another, when Satan's little season started, Satan destroyed everything and there was what they call a mud flood. I don't know, any of you heard this absurd term? A mud flood. And that this... It came and it started in this land in Asia of Tartaria and the, the, the mud just flooded all of Asia and all of Europe just like Noah's flood almost. And that's why some of these buildings, they're finding that there are ornate levels of architecture even a couple of stories underground today. Can I just tell you that every archaeologist 
who's ever done a dig can tell you that every civilization builds on top of what was there before it. In fact, in spite of what Kevin thinks, I'm not that old, <laughs> but I can go up here to underground Atlanta and see where they've built underground Atlanta and built buildings on top of that. Different buildings. You can go in stores and shops there in underground Atlanta if you're brave enough to take your life into your own hands to go up there. This, this is just a, it's just a compilation of one absurd thing on top of another. And preacher, what's the reason for it? It's all to get people to believe that those end time events that you and I know are still coming and we're still looking for, they've already happened. So I just want to assure you, they have not yet happened. The rapture of the church and the appearing of the Lord in the clouds is still what you and I are looking for today. It's the same thing John was looking for, the same thing Peter was looking for, and the same thing Paul was looking for. It is our blessed hope. You know, if Jesus already came in the millennium, where where is He? The Bible doesn't say anything about Him going back to heaven during Satan's little season. No, Jesus Jesus will still be on the throne in Jerusalem. I don't see Him sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. He hasn't just abandoned ship and left us here behind so Satan can have his little season and, and blind all of our eyes. And by the way... You know that passage in Matthew 24 that they like to quote so much about uh, even the even the elect being deceived. It doesn't say that. It said that they. It said that if it were not for the Spirit of God, even the elect would be deceived. There's no period of time during which the elect of God are going to be the deceived ones. You and I are not the deceived ones. The world is the deceived ones. And the delusion that Satan is going to bring is not going to be this end time wacky idea that Satan is, has caused everybody to believe a lie that, that Jesus has already come and that all these end time events have already happened. No, that's not the end time delusion Satan is bringing in his little season. That end time delusion he's bringing at the end of the millennium is the same as the delusion that he brought in the Garden of Eden and at the Tower of Babel and that he will bring during the tribulation period and that is that Jesus is the bad guy, Satan is the good guy. That's it. Don't make it any more complicated than that. That's all it is. All right, so preacher, you preached all morning on the millennium and some very silly things attached to it that people believe. Why? I'm going to go back to my opening illustration and that PIP, that pre-incident plan. If you and I know where we are in the course of things, number one, it ought to give us great encouragement to know that the rapture of the church is right on the horizon. We're supposed to find comfort in that. Those that don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, they say, see, you just believe it because you want to be comforted. You want to feel good about it and think we're not going to have to go through those things. No, I feel good about it. I'm comforted about it because that's what Paul said you ought to feel about reading about the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4.18, he told us about the rapture, then he finished it by saying... Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because he just told us about a pre-trib rapture of the church. You ought to be comforted. And then finally, knowing the pre-incident plan and where we are, we ought to be persuading men, women, boys and girls, of their need for Christ because the time is drawing short where you and I will be able to win anyone to Christ that we're going to win to Christ. We ought to have a greater sense of urgency in our soul winning than we do. All of us, including the preacher. 
I hope if nothing else, that's the one thing you and I leave this place this morning with is a greater sense of urgency to win the lost. Would you stand quietly to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Miss Mary, if you'll come to the piano. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, you take this message on the end times. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help it not to be convoluted in our minds and our hearts, not to be difficult to see. Help it to be clear. And Lord, help us to be grounded in your Word, not to be tossed to and fro with worry and fears because of listening to what other people say that have taken your word out of context and twisted it. Lord, help us to come back to being grounded in your word, having confidence in you and in the scriptures. Oh, dear Lord, we do pray that you would come quickly. Jesus, we're looking for you to come in the clouds for us any day. We pray even so come, Lord Jesus. But while we're yet here, while we yet remain, while we are here to occupy, dear God, I pray, use us to be effective soul winners for You. To get glory for You and to win souls that are lost. Give us a compassion for those around us that are still yet without You. Lord, help us not to think we're any better than anyone else, but to be grateful for the fact that you've brought us the gospel. Help us to share it with others, I pray. And now with heads bowed and eyes closed, Miss Mary, whenever you're ready, you begin to play.